I'm Jim Check. You're watching Kelowna Now. I have with me Cade Desjardins. Um, you wrote an opinion piece a couple of days ago now um, in, 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 on the upcoming election and also an endorsement for candidate Loyal Woodridge, who's running here in Kelowna for uh, the NDP. Yes, I did. Oh, well, first off, thanks for having me. I know that um, I'm sure that got a little bit of some backlash from some people, but I, I think that it was needed to be said, especially coming from a young person's perspective. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, answer any questions about it, and kind of talk about where we stand. This a election. little backstory: We did an interview you way back. You ran, actually, for the uh, Lake Country MP seat against Tracy Gray as well, and you actually did quite well. You got, yeah. uh, you got like 11,000 votes or something like that, a little more than 11, something like that anyway, right? Yeah, I think we finished with just over 12,000 votes actually. So yeah. that's like about 19%. So, yeah. I mean, as a 19 year old, I was, I'm this yeah, 90, that was, that's years. the impressive part. As a 19 year old, you got that many votes and a historically uh, conservative riding too, right? Like, I mean, Stephen yes. Fuhrer had won it prior, but I mean, for the most part, it's been a conservative riding for a long, long time. Yes. So we were really excited about that. And, and that's why I think Given that, I'm really excited about things coming up this October. So you you didn't run in this provincial election. You ran in a federal election as a 19 year old. Is it because you're in law school right now? Is that the reason you didn't run, or or have you changed your mind on politics? I mean, I didn't change my mind on politics, but definitely, I mean, politics is never really a plan. You need to have some kind of backup. You need to have a career, and I've always wanted to go into law school and and pursue something a little bit further. Um, so this was kind of, it, it lined up and I'm happy to be on the ground supporting the BC NDP this time around, not as a candidate, obviously, but, um, as a volunteer. Yeah. So you're in law school in Vancouver. Um, what year are you in? And I, I just started. Oh, you I just I'm started. My okay. second, my second week. So it's oh, there you me. go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend that just finished, right? So it's a long yeah. road for sure. Like it's lots of hard work, right? Lots of late nights. Oh, it's already been late nights, but yeah. it's good. <laughs> so you wrote that piece, and it's obviously it got a lot of reaction on Kelowna Now, on our on our X feed for sure, because um, I think the headline that was, was put down there, uh, uh, that it would cause you fear and anxiety if the Conservatives were to win or even the prospect of them winning. Yes, I'm, and I, I stand by those words. I think that is um, how a lot of people are feeling these days. So... A question for you. In, in the, you made some statements. I read the piece. Um, you made some statements in there. Um, I think one of the statements was, you know, and I, I, and I might get to say, maybe I'll get you to say, you referred to Nazism on some of the school stuff, and then you talked about uh, Cheerios being, um, the, the Cheerios comment caught me, and I was just like, maybe if you could explain sure. what you're saying there. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of what is being said and that I'm pointing to is just words that are coming directly out of the BC Conservative candidate's mouth. I mean, um, she's been quoted on her social media saying that social services and investing in social services is equivalent to Nazism. Um, she has been promoting this strange Whole Foods mantra on her social media as well. And saying that Cheerios and processed foods are bad for our kids. Well, I think in my mind, that's uh, really out of touch because some of these processed foods are the ones that families in our community and across BC can afford right now. And so we're not all in a privileged position position where we can go and buy the organic and the um, special whole foods that she's, you know, portraying. And I, I found, I took offense to it. And I think it's yeah. strange. I think that's, as a candidate uh, in a provincial election, that makes no sense. Um, and who, who, are we, who are we talking about here like, in general? Like, Because you're not talking about Rusted, you're talking about an sure. individual. What's, who's so the... Know, Chris, Christina Lowen, uh, oh, okay. the BC Conservative candidate for Kelowna right. Centre. Specifically, okay. that's the riding where I live. It's the riding where I'm from. Um, right. And, that, and she's running against Loyal, right? So that's yeah, kind of like your... she's running against City Councilor Loyal Wooldridge, hence why I am in full support of Loyal in this upcoming election campaign and we have a real opportunity here to make history um obviously this 
new riding provides some new demographics. It provides some new opportunities, right. as well as having a candidate like Loyal, who has been able to win two city council elections. Yeah. Loyal is very popular. Um, you know, I, I know Loyal quite well. Um, very popular city council, very popular businessman in town, right? Very, very well respected person in, in Kelowna, for sure. Absolutely. There's, there's no denying that, right? Absolutely. Um, I guess my question, be, and some of the questions, some of the questions were hard, the comments were harsh and, and not, you know, not, um, I don't think people should be making those kind of things. I mean, people love to say stuff though, right? People on, especially well, if they I feel. Mean, I, if I can butt in quickly and sure. say that when I ran as a federal candidate when I was yeah. 19, I mean, I got just the worst hate. I got yeah. death threats almost every single day. Yeah. Um, people harassing me in the streets, my family. Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of the time is if, people have nothing nice to say, then say it to my face. Um, yeah. and, and well, I think people can is- hide behind these like Bob 22, Bob 23. And I think, you know, like part of what I like about X now is the verification. So you actually have to have ownership. So I'm a big fan of, of verified people. I know some people right. think that's a bad thing to get verified. I think it's good. Then there's ownership of your comments, right? Cause then, yeah. you know, cause I think a lot of people wouldn't say to your face what they're saying online. Right. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think what also gets into the point of my article is that, or my, my letter or my opinion, I guess, is that, I mean, I've studied political science. I have a degree in political science now. Um, and I love talking about politics. I'm, I'm, I would classify myself as a political nerd. And so I love debating and speaking with folks and speaking with people about a lot of my friends are conservatives or a lot of my friends are, have different views, but once we start getting into this, this area, it, it gets a little bit, yeah, but wouldn't you say, like, just on both sides of the coin here, though, when people say, you know, like, something's a threat to democracy if you vote for this person, is that not the real threat to democracy, telling somebody they can't vote a certain way? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say we can't vote a certain way. I think people are definitely entitled to voting what, what they truthfully believe in. However, with that being said at the same time, this BC conservative brand of politics is something that this province has never seen. Um, And when candidates are putting forward anti-science views, saying things like 5G is uh, causing COVID and genocide and that vaccines make you into magnetics, um, into magnets. To be fair to that though, to be fair to that, those people were removed from the party. Um, the one with the magnets and that, right? So, well, they were removed from the party. And I mean, I guess the, the criticism that you can make, which is the same criticism that David Eby gets is that perhaps he's changing his position. Well, John Rustad's doing the exact same thing on these candidates he once defended. So, I mean, which is the real John Rustad? Yeah, I think so, is in my mind. And, and I would say this to you too, and I'm, I'm just trying to put just because we're just having a conversation here. John, John Rosted was painted early on as, you know, like a lot of ists, right? Racist, homophobic, all these types of things. But a lot of the actions, and I was trying to look at the actions of a man, like adding Eleanor Sterko to his platform doesn't fall into that narrative anymore. Adding like a person like Gavin Dew, who's a progressive conservative, I'd say he's very similar to you, like you know, have a very progressive outlook, doesn't fall into that narrative. And then, you know, taking some of the BC United candidates, and I think they, I also think they made a little bit of a mess out of it too, as well. Um, but do you not think sometimes the rhetoric on both sides is too much? And actually, um, if what we've seen in the United States too, with, with that, some of this rhetoric might incite violence and, and, and cause people to say, like, you know what I mean? We saw yesterday too, with Jagmeet Singh, um, you know, somebody was yelling profanities at him and then he challenged them and it, you know, it looked, it looked like it ter- could turn into an altercation. Should we stoop to that level? Like, you know, I know that police are supposed to take that kind of stuff. You know, when somebody's yelling obscenities at them, you're kind of like, you know, cause you're, you're obviously supposed to be better than, you know, we're upholding the law, but people are allowed to freedom of speech, even if you don't like the speech and all that kind of stuff. Right. But I, I think we're kind of at a stage where we're kind of like really like polarizing each other. Would you agree sure. with that? Well, I would say that I think, at least in my view, I mean, I try to make my observations and opinions based in fact. And right. when there's a, a, a genuine or a, a, a level of fact that we can both agree on, how we address those facts can, can differ. But I think right now we're seeing 
if you take the BC Conservative Party as a whole, sure, there can be some candidates that are now moving over. There's some BC United candidates who've been MLAs for, for a long time that are ma making the move because they had to. Um, that doesn't really get rid of the basis and fundamental beliefs that the party had and the people in power have. Um, I think that we're starting to drift from a common set of facts. And like I would say, there's definitely in any political system, an adversarial system, there's, there can be blame on both sides because rhetoric heats up and it keeps going. But what at the same time I think needs to happen is when people are lying, when candidates are lying and, and making things up and saying just random things like calling social services equivalent to Nazism, that is weird. That doesn't make sense. That's strange. And that's not based in fact. That's not based in a policy prescription. And it's not based in a way forward. And so I think what needs to happen is when comments like that are made and when people are running for office in that position, they need to be called out. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and I think you're doing that right now. Comments. You're doing that right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. How, how, <laughs> how old was that comment, I guess, is my question. Oh, I think this was probably a couple of weeks ago. Was it? it was just on her, mm. so, yeah, it was just, it was around, I think, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, she used it for um, purposes in, yeah. I guess, making some I, kind of political game. I mean, for me, I would rather we talk policy on both sides, because, you know, like, you know, like the conservatives call, you know, David Eby a, a, a radical or, you know, like extremists. And then the other side, they're calling him an extremist. And we're tossing these words around so much mm -hmm. that we're not focusing on policy, right? What What's... Like for most British Columbians, they want to put food on the table. They want to get their kids to soccer practice. They want to pay the mortgage or the rent. And and those are the issues. And I think it distracts from the real issues when we talk about, you know, like the, you know, um, serial and, 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 and obviously Nazism shouldn't. I mean, I think, you know, like that's, that's <laughs> I haven't seen the comments, so I don't want to say much, but I mean, you obviously saw it. Um, but the serial thing, you know, I would say, you know, I, I eat healthy and I wouldn't eat Cheerios, right? So... Um, I mean, it's sugar and wheat. I, I try not to eat any sugar, especially as you age. When you're a young person like yourself, you can consume a lot of sugar and get away with it. But as you age, sugar is is not your friend, right? So um, high sugar foods. Well, I, I, I think then where you kind of need to zoom out to is that if what we should be doing is measuring our candidates by how they deal with policy, right? Exactly. How they deal with policy questions. 100 when you put two candidates side by side, in this case, the conser BC Conservative candidate for Kelowna and Loyal Wolderidge, and you have a discussion on policy, like how do we address the affordable housing crisis? How do we address um, putting food on the table for people? How do we address discussions on cuts, on privatization of healthcare, as well as on privatization yeah. of insurance? We can have those discussions, those debates, but I think on one side, you're clearly going to see someone who's prepared to answer those questions and the other person who's just going to continue th continually throw um, bombastic and untrue statements out well, there. Well, uh, I think that's that's where the voters needs to look through that then, right? Do you know what I mean? Because I think what really matters to people is is what the policy is and, and how it affects them, right? Because right now, British Columbians are hurting. There's no denying that, right? The British Columbians are hurting. Young people like yourself don't like when I was your age, I knew I was going to buy a home. It's just a matter of when. Right. But I think mm -hmm. a lot of young people don't even have the hope of buying a home. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, really tough. Right. And then, and, and when you're in power, there's obviously, and the NDP have had power for seven years here, there's a greater responsibility on them, right? Because they have, um, they've had the wheel for seven years, so they have to be accountable more so than, you know, parties that are running, right? Cause you know, like there's Sonia first to know, and then there's, um, John Rustad, and now there's a bunch of independents running as well, right? After Kevin Falcon folded that party. But I think most British Columbians don't really care about the personalities so much, I think, and all the other stuff. Like, but I think what what is what how do I get a house? How do we fix homelessness? How do I get a better paying job? Like GDP in in, in British Columbia has dropped, right? So mm -hmm. Housing affordability has gotten worse, right, for everybody across Canada, right? And I know a lot of these mm -hmm. things, I had that interview with David Eby, I encourage everybody to go watch it. And a lot of that stuff for housing affordability is related to the federal government and, and, and interest rates and all those things. I mean, and also immigration, like, you know, putting more people in in, a, in an overstretched province. And David Eby said the policy is daft, right? So he said some things in there that, that make sense because you can't add 
you know, 200,000 people a year into a province that already has, you know, uh, low housing supply, right? So obviously that drives rents higher, right? Because, you know, it's just a basic economics course, right? You've probably taken one, right? So, um, but how do we get to the issues more so? Like, because mm-hmm. I do think everybody has a right to vote their conscience, right? And whether that's a conservative vote, a liberal vote, an NDP vote, or a Green Party vote. I mean, I, I believe a lot in the green stuff, right? I mean, I, I, you know, like I drive an EV, I have solar on my roof and all that kind of stuff. And I think if we listen to each other more, then we would probably maybe get a blend of stuff, right? If, you know, like to me, the best, the best government would be each MLA representing a region as opposed to towing a party line. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I would say that this kind of polarization in BC and a I mean, the federal polarization that's occurring and is, you know, you can just watch five minutes in question period in the House of Commons and see how <laughs> hateful things are quickly spewed across the aisle to each other to, to take note and see. And, you know, that stuff bleeds down. That stuff comes down to the lower levels. It bleeds down from not provincial levels, even to the local levels mm-hmm. and the conversations we have with each other. And so... Yes. I think it's it really requires leadership from the top, from top down, in order to show and lead by example. I also think, though, that I think what I said also in my 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 letter um, was that we've lost our way in realizing the things that unite us, the things that bind us together. We we all are struggling. And let's I think, look at the commonalities. I agree with you there as well. And then and then we can do part and debate on the things that we disagree on. And we yep. can debate on the things that, and I like the other thing that I, I wanted to say as well is that you look at a political party, I mean, political parties aren't really built for you to fall in love with. And there's going to be parts of each party yeah. that you don't agree with and that you think need to be changed. And so I think folks need to take that perspective when they go to the ballot and see that, you know what, I'm not going to be in love with every single part, every single policy yeah. of e- either side. Um I do know this candidate. I do know what they stand for either locally or within their own personal lives and make an educated decision on that front. And I think once we start dialing down the rhetoric a bit, I mean, it does require, though, some accountability. And I think accountability is important because when people um, are allowed to keep elevating, you know, heated rhetoric, then you get to a point where it's, license to say whatever you want um and license to to say things without any any facts behind them and so i I think yeah i would think that uh i would like to see politicians held more accountable for sure but the polls show if you talk about federally the polls show canadians have had enough of this government i mean that's that's clear in the polls right and they've had enough and even the the, you know if the liberal party I, i think according to the polls wants to save itself it needs a leadership change right because i think that that is that is clear to Canadians because, again, if we look at where people are at, you know, they, they you know they keep getting told that it's so great when it doesn't feel great. You know what I mean? If you keep someone keeps telling you like it's great and you're just like it's like I, am I crazy because it doesn't feel great, right? You know, people losing their jobs and and you know they can't afford rent and you know like you know like just one example on on the mortgage rate. If you have a million dollar mortgage. And when they raised interest rates after Tiff Macklin said they will not raise rates for the foreseeable future, that you can rest assured, go out and take that mortgage. A 19-fold interest rate on a million-dollar mortgage is next to almost $3,000 a month. And you tell me how many Canadians have $3,000 a month, like leeway, to just add to their mortgage payment, which then adds to rent and which adds to all those things. Like, I don't, there's, there's, there isn't that flexibility in most Canadian pocketbooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would agree. And I think as well, some of these issues though can be addressed provincially and i think there's a comment you made you know that the ndp have kind of been in the driver's seat for the last seven years well it takes one second to zoom out and see well john russhead was in the driver's seat in cabinet for in a government that was in power for 16 years and so how much catch up does this government and our NDP government, David Eby, need to do in order to actually make sure that British Columbians are getting the message that the support is there. And I mean, the polarization doesn't help when there's two very different visions for the province moving forward. I think the the decision is clear cut. Either 
there's investment in public services, there's investment in affordable housing, and there's investment into the most vulnerable populations in our communities. Or there is a perspective that privatization moving forward in cuts and being more, uh, let's say, fiscally restraint, um, which has its own, you know, policy prescriptions added, uh, attached to it. Um, you for can provinces, have space. provinces have one, uh, don't have one thing that the, the federal government has. The, the province has no ability to print money. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the federal government can print money and kind of fill its coffers by printing printing money. The provincial government is supposed to balance its budget, right? That's because they don't have the ability. They they can sell bonds, right? But it's it's definitely at a lesser kind of thing. It's 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 tougher for sure, right? So there there has to be accountability as well, right? We definitely need to be, um, and I think they can do it with with selling bonds and then doing projects and all kinds of stuff. And then because we are a measure of also of our lowest common denominator, right? If, 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 if there's so much of our population suffering, obviously we're not doing a good job, right? And, and I don't well, think, I we're, mean, I don't think I, we're doing I a good say, job right now. I would say that like the economic policy that, I mean, is in the most general sense is when times are good, you save money. When times are bad, you spend. Right. When times are not good right now. And we need a government that spends the money in places that matter. Um, and in my view, <laughs> we're in a period of time where we can't be, we can't be skimping out on the services we offer people, and we can't yeah. be restraining and punishing those for being in a position that was exacerbated by the pandemic. So what? What? By- why don't we ask this? What you're endorsed loyal, right? And obviously that in itself endorses the NDP. What do you think the NDP will do that will help British Columbians in the next? If, if David Eby's never been elected before, this is his first time because he was appointed when John Horgan stepped down. What do you think his mandate will be and what do you think he'll bring British Columbians and what do you hope he'll bring for British Columbians? Well, I mean, I think some of the progress is what we're already seeing is 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 rents decreasing, especially in areas in Vancouver and across the province. Um, investments in places and taking letting the government, you know, get back into the housing sector and incentivizing low income housing, incentivizing affordable housing um, is definitely a mandate that we need to see. One area that we need to see improvement in that doesn't really have a clear cut path forward is healthcare. Um, the issue right now is not necessarily um, funding levels and so on and so on and so on. It's just the lack of doctors and the lack of nurses. Um, and so I think projects like the new medical school in SFU and, and more incentives to have doctors go into rural medicine. Um, are areas that I'd love to see that this province keep moving forward with there was and have a, a mandate. There was an opinion piece put out out of Surrey there, but a bunch of doctors saying that there needs to be leadership changes. Um, and also there's been attacks on, on Adrian Dix and, and Dr. Bonnie Henry over the vaccine mandate that stretched over past anybody else in North America that, that still has, um, especially in the interior, has healthcare workers um, that they were out of the job for a long time. And I think in Oliver, that emergency room has been closed 31 times. And I can't remember the period. Like, do you know what I mean? The interior hospital emergency rooms have been closed. They've been, people have been asked to drive up to 400 kilometers to go to an emergency room because of the lack of, of ER. And the, 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 the doctor or the mayor in merit has been quite vocal. Um, we interviewed him. Uh, he had two doctors, both left because of the vaccine mandate. And he, they've closed that emergency room many times over. And he's completely frustrated. So you talk about healthcare. How do we fix that healthcare? Like, how does how does he get those? Because it's hard to get a doctor to move to merit, right? No matter what, right? You know, on the best day, it's hard to get a doctor to move to merit. How do we <laughs> well, how do we get how do we get doctors and nurses into those l- rural communities? Right. I mean, again, I'm not in the the premier's office, and I how do we fix healthcare is a very complex question. Um, but in my mind, I think that there's only a finite number of doctors um, and there's some that are being added to our system year after year that are coming through school. The way we increase the amount of doctors in our system is increasing the pathways to education um, and pathways to education for, to become more doctors, to have more doctors enter the system. And that means investment in our public school system. It means investment in secondary school. I mean, post-secondary school education as well as more seats in the medical system and as well in the nursing schools. And I've come from a background of advocating from the student union at UBCO. I was the president of the student union there and the vice president for, I was there for three years. Um, 
And education is a pathway to elevating not just our healthcare system, not just um, you know our economy, but just the lives lives of people in general. And I think um, if we that would be one thing. Another thing, uh, a mandate that I'd like to see David Eby kind of move forward on when he's elected as our premier is um, to continue that advocacy for for students and for increasing pathways to education and for entering the healthcare system. Education is never too heavy to carry around, that's for sure, right? So the mm-hmm. I think education is the path forward almost everything, including a lot of the isms, racism, and all those things, right? Education is our is our path to a better tomorrow. There's no doubt about it. Um, Absolutely. Um, what, I, I, while I have you here, you're a young guy. We're actually doing our AI summit. I'm going to put a little plug in here. What What do you think of that? Like, you're going through law school. AI is is can be viewed as a threat to to lawyers, right? Do you know what I mean? Because you know AI can do a lot of this. So when you're you're just starting on your path as a lawyer, um, does that scare you, or does it intrigue you, or or, or or what what do you think of it? Well, I mean, I would say. AI, if we stick to a bit of a political sense to AI has shown to be quite a bit of a threat to a, one of our, you know, common base of facts, because there's, you know, trolls online and, and those and accounts that are kind of faking comments made by po- politicians and celebrities and so on. Um, so that part's scary because it can be used as a tool to divide us for sure. Um, but I also would say that AI coming from while I'm in school right now and in education, it can be a good tool. It can be a tool that if we utilize it correctly in a way that, you know, doesn't uh, cross over to plagiarism or cross over to any of those kind of um, possibilities that come with chat GPT or AI in general, if we can really harness the power of AI and technology, I think, and have a government as well that supports that, um, then I think that we can make a lot of progress. It does. It's not scary. That's change. Change is always scary, yep. for sure. Um, but it's how does it scare you that most of that technology is in the hands of like a few tech overlords that some people would say? <laughs> well, I'm not. A, I don't know if I'm a fan of a tech overlord, but hey, um, we'll we'll leave that for the experts. Yeah, I mean, I, I literally have a car that drives me back and forth to work. I don't touch the steering wheel, and I talk to okay, ChatGPT well, on my way well. back and forth, right? So, okay, well, Jim, I hope uh, I hope you do drive. I hope you got both hands on the wheel on the way home today. Okay. No, both hands are off the wheel on one hundred percent. I have to watch the the camera watches my eyes, but it is full self drive, supervised Absolutely. though, right? Wow. Well, yeah. I mean. Uh, I guess for a final, I'm not sure how much time we have, but for a final word, uh, I just thank you for having me. Um, I would implore everyone that's on Kelowna now, that's um, on any kind of news or ever, any any person who's digesting news to do your research. Uh, the election's October 19th. I think voting is a principle near and dear to my heart. I think it's really, really important. Um, Everybody should and, exercise it. Absolutely. So at the end of the day, regardless of who wins the election, I want to see that voter turnout much higher than it has been in the past. Apathy is is definitely our worst enemy. And I think people need to voice because to a true democracy, it is the voice of the people that matters, right? Because the people and Ronald Reagan said it best. Government should be scared of the people, not the other way around. That and it's the voice of the people when you get to have your say, right? Because every four years they come out and they promise you all these things and they say they're going to do this and that and then they don't do any of that stuff. And then four years later, here's your chance to have your voice. Make sure you get everybody young, old and and in between to go out and vote. Mother, daughter, sister, brother, cousin and uh, exercise your vote. And uh, because that's what a democracy is. Absolutely. And when you get up to go vote, go vote. For Loyal Woldridge in the BCND. There you go. There you go. Um, (laughs) And and thank you for doing this, Cade. Maybe we'll do it again because it it sounds like you're going to have a political future too because maybe that lawyer thing is not going to work out with AI. Well, I mean, if the tech overlords have anything to do with it, then maybe I won't. There you go. Good luck in law school. And uh, thank you for taking this. And uh, we thank you for watching Kelowna Now.